Welcome. This is Chris McAlpin with Sound Financial. And today we're, I am joined with, by Clint Sorensen, our lead investment strategist, a CFA and a CMT. Clint, how you doing today, buddy? Doing great, Chris. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm glad you're joining us today. And so far, our listeners, our clients, our friends, we want to give you a bird's eye view of what's going on in the economy, what's going on in the markets, uh, our second quarter update from a high level, and insight into what we're thinking about in the markets and in the economy. So, Clint, let's get started, buddy. Absolutely. First, as we're thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic, and to set the, the economic and the market stage for us, what was going on in the U.S. and the global economy in both January and February of this year? Yeah, so, you know, Chris, I always like to point to this framework dashboard when we get into this part of the conversation because this is very useful in us understanding where we are in the business cycle. And there's four uh, essentially business cycle phases. You have contraction or recession, which is where we are today. And then we'll talk about that there in, a, in here in a moment. We have a, a recovery, which is coming out of that recession. So that phase of a recovery. We have an expansion. So I think after the recovery, we're growing great. Everything seems the best. And then we have the slowdown, which is what leads up to that recession. Now, when we got into 2018, so uh, beginning of 2018, we actually global economy started to slow. And you saw that with global stocks starting to fall. U.S. economy didn't start to slow until the end of 2018. And then 2019 was really the year of dislocation. You had markets really running up, like everything was great, but the economy continued to slow. So when we started off this year, we were already in a slowing economy globally. We started to see some signs that we may recover, and then bam, the COVID virus hits us, and it throws, it throws fuel on an already burning fire, uh, and now we're in that contraction. So as we think about the markets as the scoreboard for the economy, that, that's not always correct, huh? It, so they can, they can kind of dislocate? Yeah, absolutely. So what I call what, what, that dislocation is really uh, evidence or symptomatic of something else underlying it. And so we always talk about, I know you and I talk about this privately, it's liquidity drives the business cycle. So liquidity, the availability of money. Um, think about us taking on amount, masses of amounts of debt, and then think about even recently us stimulating and providing liquidity uh, through the Federal Reserve's policy. Uh, that can have an effect on market sentiment, and that can push risk assets up despite economic growth uh, be, you know, slowing down. And so sometimes you get these dislocations, and we can recognize that by just paying attention to what the Fed's doing or monetary policy, which I have here on this, uh, on this dashboard as well and paying attention to market sentiment. And so starting off the year, both market sentiment were green and monetary policy was green because the Fed started cutting interest rates last year in 2019, responsibly so due to the slowdown we were in, and market sentiment responded to that by moving more aggressive. And so you had this risk on environment that quickly changed as we, as we got through February uh, of this year. Sure, sure. So when you say liquidity, it brings us to March. March was March was crazy in a way that I'm not sure that you and I've ever seen in our career. Uh, you, you had record down days. You had record up days. Fastest bear market in modern history, and technically or by definition, one of the fastest or the fastest bull markets in modern market history. So what happened? What were we seeing in the month of March? Yeah, so the month of March was actually worse uh, than, than 2008 uh, by many respects, especially uh, in the stock and bond markets uh, liquidity. So what had happened was you had this, uh, all of a sudden this realization that we were coming from super high valuations. So markets have never been this overvalued. And I'll, I'll point to just a couple charts here to show that. But here is the Buffett indicator. And on the far right, that's where we were entering the year. And even with this recent pullback, uh, which isn't that much, uh, we're still pretty elevated. We were higher uh, than where we were in 2000 at the beginning of this year. So we had this 
massive uh, overvaluation where stocks were priced for essentially zero returns if you bought and held the S&P 500. And then all of a sudden you have this negative catalyst, which is the COVID virus acting upon that in a slowing economy. And it just uh, uh, caused massive risk aversion really quick. And when everybody's trying to rush through the exit door or, or in a musical chairs analogy, everyone's trying to sit down in that final chair, a lot of people fall down. And, and we had that. We had, a, uh, we had too much selling, no one buying, and you had huge illiquidity. And so the Fed immediately stepped up, and rightfully so, to support the markets by launching limitless QE, buying uh, treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities and municipal bonds. Uh, now co corporate bonds and high yield bonds. So they really stepped up to provide that needed liquidity to try to stabilize the market action. And that's what we saw. We saw no liquidity uh, in, in, in that was very concerning. And at times it was really, really scary. Yeah, and, and, and we'll, we'll get to the liquidity in just a second. But on this chart right here, this one is one that you and I talk about a lot the valuation of the market itself uh, in layman's terms how do we uh, how should we understand that overall picture of what this chart tells us yeah so what that chart tells us is essentially this uh you know i hate to point to another chart to explain a chart that doesn't sound uh, very good but we're going to do that this anyway. is your cfa coming out in you this is your, <laughs> your numbers exactly. nerd coming out man so, so this is real expected returns and think about this a negative 10 percent per year over 10 years to positive 15 percent per year over the next 10 years that's what valuations tell us is what is our expected return on average it doesn't tell us exactly how that's going to happen it doesn't say that we're going to have two percent exactly two percent each and every year for the next 10. it just says at the end of a 10-year period you're going to look back and you're going to realize that your stock investments have most likely you know uh, given you nothing and that's where we were at the beginning of the year, very similar to where we were in 2000. And I always ask this question in seminars that I, that I give. I always say, hey, if I, by a show of hands, and I should do a poll right now, by a show of hands, how many of you think stocks have outperformed bonds over the last 20 years on average? And most people raise their hands and say, absolutely, stocks outperform bonds over the long term. But that's not what we find. And uh, if you started and invested equal dollars in the Vanguard total bond market, uh, and the S&P 500 uh, in 2000, which would be April of 2000, and you held them to today, and you look back at your investment, bonds would have drastically outperformed. And that goes back to that chart. The reason why is 2000, I'll put a pointer on it, 2000 was here. So we were significantly overvalued and priced for 0% returns. And so uh, it was better places to put your money. If you bought and held the S&P here, you didn't do so hot um, on the average. So I think you averaged about 3% uh, after everything was said and done. So we were we were in the same position to uh, at the beginning of the year. And, and frankly, today, you're still not exactly cheap by U.S. standards. Now, other markets are inexpensive, but the U.S. still pretty expensive here. It's priced, uh, if you bought and held the S&P 500, to earn pretty low returns, but better off, better uh, better returns than when we where we started the year. So that's what all this chart tells you is what's on average my return going to be if I bought and held uh, the market for the next uh, 10 to 20 years. It's really good at that. It tells us and nothing. That is, and that is if you bought and held the broad, broad market, not a properly right. built portfolio or diverse portfolio or uh, trend-following portfolio, just simply if you bought and held the total U.S. stock market. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so it okay. tells us that we need to have trend following. We need to have diversity. We need to have these other things uh, to help, you know, construct a portfolio that can weather whatever the market throws at it. It, it, it actually screams for the need of that diversification. Sure. So in, in the midst of us talking about this, we, we, we hear these numbers coming out. Uh, or headlines such as this. Last week was the biggest one-week stock market gain since 1974. Uh, last three weeks, we enter into, by definition, a, a bull market, a new bull market. So is this rally uh, a bear trap, or is this rally the, a real, the real deal, a turnaround? Yeah, so the odds are that it, it, it is a, a bear market rally. Uh, so we are in a negative trend in, in, in stocks here in the S&P 500. And this rally is characteristic of every rally we tend to have in these bear markets. So if you look back at 
uh, every rally from the peak in 1929 to the bottom in 1932, you had some pretty massive rallies. You actually had a 46% rally at one point during that period. If you look back to 2000 to 2003, you had several rallies that were over 20%, uh, several in that 12 to 20% range. And if you look back in the 2000 to 2009 debacle, you had several rallies as well that were in that 12 to 20% range. So this is perfectly characteristic of what happens in that. Um, you know, we got really, really oversold due to that illiquidity we saw. And that oversold condition resulted in a lot of opportunity for the market to bounce and kind of give relief or clearing, kind of clearing those oversold conditions. And I think that's what we've witnessed over the last several weeks. Um, but the fact is that the, the, the poor economic data is still yet to come. The poor earnings and corporate profit declines are still yet to come. And so we have to be cautious here due to that environment. And, and again, if we want to keep it simple, stocks are trending lower and we don't want to own things that are trending lower. Well, that leads to my next question. Why do you think it was best for us? Because you're our lead investment strategist. You were, you're leading this discussion. Why, do you, why did you think it was best for us to overweight bonds versus stocks? Yeah, so bonds uh, are, are in a positive trend uh, and are outperforming stocks. So that's, uh, I just let the market, so going back to our, our, our dashboard, right? When we look at our dashboard, market sentiment is that thing on the top. And what market sentiment tells us is that everyone thinks from market sentiment perspective, we need to somehow be contrarian or call the turning points of the market we don't think you can time adequately the turning points of the market. What our goal is, is to just be in harmony with the short-term trend of the market. And that's negative. And so in order to be harmon you know, in order to be in harmony with those short-term trends, we want to be in things that are moving up, things that are tell that are that are that are doing well in this environment because we think we're nowhere near out of the woods yet. And so it's simply an observation, Chris, of what's working and what's working is bonds. And so we want to be in those positions. It's bonds and cash and uh, the U.S. dollar, right? So that, those are the things that are doing really well in that environment, in, in the environment today, and and with economic growth there at the bottom set to move into the red over the course of the next month, uh, we want to be positioned in those assets uh, to protect portfolios. So risk management is on as at top of mind. There will be a time for return enhancement, but it's not now. I'm actually uh, more bullish or optimistic about the future than I've ever been from an investment perspective, and that's because these type of events or crises present amazing opportunities uh, on the back end. And so I'm itching to jump in, but uh, right now what's working is bonds and cash. And so we'll, we'll stay prudent and patient and wait until uh, we start to see signs that stocks and other risk assets are, are, are optimal. Well, and I'm gonna ask you about your bullishness in just a minute, but because you've been a perma bear for about two years, but the, uh, uh, so, so this overweight of bonds versus stocks, and, and again, I mean, this is for our listeners. This is not advice. This is not anybody's direct uh, investment strategy here. We're talking about our portfolios in general. But even though the President Trump and the leadership are trying to reopen the economy by mid-May, by the end of May, by the 1st of June, they, they, they keep talking about dates like this. You're still saying, hey, let's, let's, let's be defensive. Let's uh, move with the trends. Let's not try to front run that turnaround. What do, what do you say to headlines like that? Yeah, I mean, I think those are all encouraging headlines, but they're no guarantee that economic growth is going to pick up, right? Getting the economy. What if the, you get the economy back open and no one shows up, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think consumption is going to change a little bit, especially on the short run. I think psychology has been impacted. And I, th I think travel is going to be hit pretty hard. So I think, I think and with unemployment, I think you're going to still get some some pretty dire economic uh, growth situations. And I think that those take longer to work out of than people expect. The economy doesn't be, meaning it doesn't just drop and then go right back up to where it was. It takes a little longer. And so with a prolonged negative out, um, prolonged negative impact of, of the virus and the economic shutdowns, I think, uh, I think that we need to be prudent and patient until we start to see recovery signs. So that's, that's why I just think it takes longer than most people realize. And I think you're going to have a lot of bumps along the road. Even if we opened up the economy next week, you're, you're most likely going to get rolling shutdowns. Uh, if you look at what's going on in Japan and Singapore, as they tried to open back up, uh, they shut down really quick with, uh, with new cases, right? As soon as new cases start to hit, they shut down things again. 
So you could end up getting yeah. these periods of rolling shutdowns, and I think that could be a negative on the economy, broad, broadly speaking. Sure. All right, so this is a question that, that we get a lot. I'm kind of looking at some questions from, from clients and from our advisors, and it kind of mixes in with what are we watching for right now, but from the kind of the lens or the perspective of the fear of missing out, the fear of missing that turnaround, or missing that run up in stocks from being so defensive. What we we don't have a crystal ball. I mean, you and your team, you and our team watch data all the time. I applaud you. Y'all do a wonderful job for us. But how do we know what to do next? Yeah, so that's why this framework's up front and center, right? This is why we focus on this time and time again. When the weight of the evidence is positive meaning we have market sentiment improving, monetary policies accommodative like it is today, market valuations are more attractive, so they're in that yellow to green zone, and economic growth is moving towards green instead of moving towards red. Uh, those are all, that's the weight of the evidence that suggests that it's time to take on risk. We're really not fixated on what the S&P or the Dow do, um, because catching up to those is not uh, not a difficult thing if we get the business cycle right, meaning we go into a recovery, we know we can uh, add to small caps or we can add to value stocks. And those things are going to do far better than buying and holding the Dow Jones or the S&P um, in a recovery phase of an economic cycle. And so it's really just about being prudent and patient, realizing we don't have to get every move of the Dow or the S&P. Our goal is to capture the big trends and to make sure that we are protecting capital first and foremost. And so that's that's how we know what to do next. We just wait on the evidence and the data to to tell us what to do, and we move in harmony with that data. And if we if we do that with discipline and without wavering, um, and then at the end of the day, our opinion is that that, that clients will be very pleased. Sure. We well, looking at the dashboard. Uh, you and I look at this all the time, so I think it's good to point out that market sentiment is in the red and it's still moving left. Yeah. Uh, Market valuations are uh, peakish there, but it's moving left. Economic growth is squarely in the middle, but it's moving left. That's right. So we're going to be looking for those to be moving right. They might be in the red, moving right, and we would move. We would be more bullish. Is that a fair way of thinking about that? That they that's may be way over to the left, but as soon as they start moving right, that's is that what we're looking for? That data that tells us that they, that they have started a true trend moving to the right. That's exactly right. Um, so we want to see everything moving into the green zone. Um, yeah. with, you know, I doubt the valuations will get into the green zone, but even in the yellow would be nice um, sure. because, because of the way that the, the Fed is stimulating and buying assets. But uh, look, any kind of movement to the right is, is a welcome sign. Clint, do we want to bring up all the, the 642 charts that you usually have to support this data? Do you think our listeners no, would want to? <laughs> we do not. They're in this deck. We don't want to do that to them? No. no. If you want to see no. it out, you can. It's in the deck. No, man. I won't do that to them. Hey, listen. This is this is a good time for us to wrap up. We appreciate y'all listening. And we want to do more of these. Clint and I are going to have more topics to discuss where we unpack our framework. But I, I, so for, for a couple of years now, we've written about our rules-based investment strategies. This is how it works. Uh, Clint and his team are, are the guys that uh, are measuring the data and helping us make decisions of where to overweight or underweight our portfolios or how to move risk on, risk off. And, and again, we're not trying to time the peaks or the valleys. We're just wanting to invest with the trends. So very similar to a fish swimming with the current and not against it. And uh, we appreciate the trust that you put into us to manage your money, help you plan your financial future, help you manage your retirement plans. We look forward to talking to you soon. Clint, my oh man, do you, do you have anything to add? Uh, I don't. Just thank you. And, um, you know, thank you for the trust and confidence. And, you know, I, I would say just just wait. This is uh, this is setting up to be one of the most um incredible opportunities that we've seen as investors and i know that it's tough and it's scary out there and these are difficult times but we will get through it together and when we do uh there will be some amazing opportunities and uh we're very excited about that eventual eventual scenario so um let's stay prudent and patient in the meantime but 
very excited about that. And thank you, Chris, for, for having us on the call. Absolutely, bud. Talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone.